Rises were intense. Lavoisier conducted another experiment at his home in the arsenal, where he worked as commissioner of gunpowder, having helped America's revolution with material, as much as Lafayette had aided with men. Several porcelain cups were filled with water, one supposedly strongly magnetized. A particularly sensitive woman who, in anticipation, had already experienced a crisis in Lavoisier's antechamber, received each cup in turn. She began to quiver after touching the second cup and fell into a full crisis upon receiving the fourth. When she recovered and asked for a cup of water, the foxy Lavoisier finally passed her the magnetized liquid. This time, she not only held, but actually imbibed, although she drank tranquilly and said that she felt relieved. The commissioners then proceeded to the reverse test of magnetizing without unleashing the power of suggestion. They removed the door between two rooms at Franklin's home and replaced it with a paper partition, offering no bar at all, according to Deslan, to the flow of mesmeric fluid. They induced a yell. Ung seamstress, a woman with particularly acute sensitivity to magnetism, to sit next to the partition. From the other side, but unknown to the seamstress, an adept magnetizer tried for half an hour to fill her with fluid and induce a crisis. During all this time, Miss B made gay conversation, asked about her health. She freely answered that she felt very well. Yet, when the magnetizer entered the room, and his presence became known, while acting from an equal or greater distance, the seamstress began to convulse after three minutes and fell into a full crisis in twelve minutes. The evident finding, after so many conclusive experiments, that no evidence exists for Mesmer's fluid and that all noted effects may be attributed to the power of imagination, seems almost anticlimactic, and the commissioners offered their result with clarity and brevity. The practice of magnetization is the art of increasing the imagination by degrees. Lavoisier then ended the report with a brilliant analysis of the reasons for such frequent vogues of irrationalism throughout human history. He cited two major causes or predisposing factors of the human mind and heart. First, our brains just don't seem to be well equipped for reasoning by probability. Fads find their most fertile ground in subjects, like the curing of disease, that require a separation of many potential causes and an assessment of probability in judging the value of a result. The art of concluding from experience and observation consists in evaluating probabilities, in estimating if they are high or numerous enough to constitute proof. This type of calculation is more complicated and more difficult than one might think. It demands a great sagacity generally above the power of common people. The success of charlatans, sorcerers, and alchemists, and all those who abuse public credulity, is founded on errors in this type of calculation. I would alter only Lavoisier's patrician assumption that ordinary folks cannot master this mode of reasoning and write instead that most people surely can but, thanks to poor education and lack of encouragement from general culture, do not. The end result is the same, riches for Las Vegas and disappointment for Pete Rose. But at least the modern view does not condemn us to a permanent and inevitable status as saps, dupes, and dunces. Second, whatever our powers of abstract reasoning, we are also prisoners of our hopes. So long as life remains disappointing and cruel for so many people, we shall be prey to irrationalisms that promise relief. Lavoisier regarded his countrymen as more sophisticated than previous suckers of centuries past, but still victims of increasingly sly manipulators. Nothing has changed today, as the Gellers and von Danikins remain one step ahead of their ever-gullible disciples.